now let's come to that so to keep things very uh, concrete what i'm going to do is i'm going to assume three segments okay just three segments and we'll build our system of equations for three segments for these three segments let's so what are what we'll call them is this is element 1 element 2 element 3 okay and this is node 1 node 2 node 3 and node 4 okay so what are my shape functions like how many shape functions do you have for this six shape functions okay so what do they look like So this is my u i, i is equal to, so this is, what do we, we put the, we put it like this, right, i and e, i is equal to 1 to 2 and e is equal to 1, 2 and 3. So total of 6 shape functions. So, with this in mind, how do I write the field? I write the field u of x in terms of these, these uh, basis functions, right? So, it is a summation and this time we will explicitly open up the summation, okay? So, the first unknown, let us write the unknown and then the shape function. So, first unknown, uh, okay, let us get rid of this summation. So, is u11 multiplied by n11, correct? x next is going to be u so 1 on top and 2 below n 1 2 x right uh, what else the next I go to u 2 1 n 2 1 u 2 2 now that you get the hang of it you can write it quickly okay and plus u 3 1 n 3 1 plus u 3 2 n 3 2 okay all of this is function of x this is how you would write it okay now of these uh, variables some variables are the same right these unknowns some of these unknowns so these are unknowns right of these unknowns some of the unknowns are the same which are they u21 u12 what else u22 and u31 right so the common variables let's just indicate them they are the same and they are equal to u2 and u3 respectively okay so what you could do is just a way of rewriting this if i wanted to write it in terms of moving from local to global if i wanted to rewrite it i could write it like this u1 n11x plus u2 n21x plus n2 1 to x right plus u3 n2 1 x uh, have I made a mistake somewhere yeah this should be n2 2 actually plus n3 1 x correct so this was the first one was local the other one was global okay uh, u4 this should be local and global what unknown numbers now these two functions over here that i have in in uh, these green brackets over here if I 
if I want to plot them over here, let's, let's try to plot the functions that I have shown highlighted in green over here. Okay, so some of you see where this is going. So we'll draw it a little bit bigger here. 1, 2, 3 and 4. Okay. So the first one, n1 x, which way is it opening? Is it left or right? n11 x, this first term over here, left, right? So this is what it looks like, 1 at this point and this thing. This is my n11 x, correct, agree? What about um, n, the second term in the uh, green bracket? What does it look like? It is a sum of two functions, two triangles, one opening to the right, one opening to the left. So it is going to look like correct. I am going to call this, uh, let us call this uh, T, let us call it T2. The next uh, term in the brackets again is going to look just like this one except it will be shifted by one node, right. This is going to be my, I am going to call this T3, okay. And finally the fourth one over here is going to be my usual N32, that is right opening third segment. Okay. So, this guy. Okay. So, how many unknowns did I have in the global, in the, uh, in the overall problem? U1, U2, U3, U4. Okay. So, the reason that I did this combination is because remember I have six shape functions. If I do my testing with all six shape functions, what will I get? I will get six equations for each one of them, one for each one of them, but how many variables? Four variables, right? It will turn out and you can work this out. It will turn out that two of those equations are redundant. They are just formed by taking a linear combination of some of the other equations. So to avoid having to do that. What I am, what I have done is, I have combined adjacent shape functions into, for example, here T2 and T3, okay. So, these above over here, these are my shape functions and these guys that I have drawn over here, these are what I will make into my testing functions or weight functions. Okay, this is still Galerkin's method because uh, the shape functions and the weight functions are the same. What I am giving you is a bit of a shortcut, one, one shortcut compared to what most of the books have. Most of the books will make you go through six equations, four variables and then eliminate and come back to four. What we are doing is directly arriving at four because we, we can anticipate what is going to happen. Okay, so these are the four uh, testing functions. Four testing functions. When I apply it to my uh, equation, I will get four equations, four variables, okay. So in general, this is a strategy. What is, how did, uh, I mean, if you look at it, how did we combine this? Wherever a node was shared, I combined the shape function. That's what I did. The endpoints could not be shared, so they remain as they are, okay. So now let's, uh, let's go step by step. Uh, Let's do testing now with respect to each of these basis functions, okay. So let's look back at our equation over here. So uh, okay, so we'll, let's write this down over here. So the first term is w prime x u prime x minus, this is a minus and a plus k naught squared. Uh, w x u x 
is equal to uh, the endpoint term, right? So this is equal to minus W x u prime x. Okay. Why did I move this term to the right hand side? Because we we should know this. U prime x is where I'm going to impose my boundary conditions, which I derived. And it is uh, Wx is of course known. Now without doing uh, this end, so this should be done for every W that I take, I will have this endpoint contribution. Can you look at this and say which all endpoints will appear in the final equation? Okay, we will come to it as we start calculating it, we will we'll come to it. Okay, so let us now, let us do uh, testing with. So the first weighting function which is equal to n11, that is my w1, okay, that is what I am going to do. u continues to be, so u of x we will continue to write it as uh, in this form, right, u i e n i e x, that is, that is what I will write it as, okay. Uh, and this is also equal to in very short compact notation what is this u1 n1 plus u2 t2 plus u3 t3 plus u4 let us call it n4 okay actually n yeah fine we will just call it n2 n1 and n2 and t2 and t3 so what do we what do we get with when we test with uh, n1, we just shorthand notation for this n1, okay. So, yeah, let us make it k square. Yeah, there might be an epsilon inside, so that will be absorbed inside k square. So, we will just leave it as k square. k squared is in general position dependent, yeah. Otherwise, this is empty space. Then we should include, correct, you are right. Yeah, good. Yeah, I mean if epsilon is 1 everywhere, it is a very uninteresting problem. It is free space that I am simulating, right. But in our, in our case, there might be an object in between and that k will have epsilon mu inside it, okay. We are just keeping it as k squared for now. So, this is a function of x, okay. Okay, so what happens to the first equation? So what is going to be W prime and U? So okay, what is what is W one prime? And what, constant equal to what? Minus one by? No, the nodes are not equispaced. I mean, they are not spaced by one. Remember the definition of n one, right? It was uh, what was it? X two minus x divided by x two minus x one, right? So if I call this spacing to be some delta, right? So then uh, w1 prime x is going to be equal to minus 1 by delta, okay. uh, all right. What about u prime x in this and this integral is over which segment now? This integral is going to be only over segment e1. All other segments are 0 because uh, w itself is 0 outside it, right. So the uh, derivative is also not defined outside of it. So u prime x, this is my u over here. So, which all terms will appear in u prime or you can look at this form, okay. Look at this form of u of x. Now, you have to evaluate u prime of x. So, what will happen over here? So, let us write it down minus integral of over e1 w prime x is we said minus 1 by delta, okay. u prime x. So, I have to take the derivative of this term and this term because both of them are non-zero in E, E1, right. These other terms will not appear because they, they are not in the support. Delta is the width of the segment, this delta which I have marked over. Derivative, I have W prime x, right, this is W dash, yeah. It need not be the same. The lengths that I have shown are equispaced over here but they need not be the same, okay. Uh, so, instead of delta, I will write delta 1, okay, minor details. 
Okay, u prime x. What do I write in u prime x? What is the derivative of n11 x? Minus u1 divided by delta. Okay, and plus u2 by delta dx. Other terms are not going to appear. Then I come here. K squared. Now I have wx multiplied by ux. So what is this going to be? Wx is n1, right? So in my in in this notation, it's n1. So wx is n1 squared plus uh, n1x. Actually, I should I should write it a little bit more carefully over here. Is the product of n11x with the other two terms. So there's going to be uh, u1 n11x plus u2 n21x. Sorry. Correct. Dx and and the endpoints term. Okay. So. What can I say about the endpoints? At which at which points am I evaluating this? At u1 and u2 is where I have to evaluate this. Okay. So the first is so this is going to be at uh, um, node one minus node two. That's what it is going to be. So what is the value at node two? This is node two. At node two, what is the value of w x at node two? W x is my n one x. 0. So, I have a minus 0. What is the value of wx at node 1? 1. What is the value of u prime x at node 1? It's a trick question. Minus? Trick question. u2 is not going to appear. So all of you, what you are doing is you are looking at the form of ux, you are taking the derivative and telling me what it is. Forgetting that, why did I move this term to the right hand side? It should be known. So known is coming from where? Not from the form I have assumed for ux, but from the boundary condition. So what is my boundary condition? Let's go back to it. Boundary condition is u prime x, right? So u prime x is equal to uh, minus j omega, let's just call this whole term some alpha, okay. So, is equal to alpha into ux. I have to use this, otherwise I mean I am not imposing boundary condition. So, uh, okay, so wx at the boundary is 1 and u prime x is going to be alpha times, alpha times 1. So, boundary Point node number 2, this is node 2, that has no contribution. Node 1, u prime is equal to alpha ux. What is ux at node 1? Yeah, but what is that? u1 with an alpha minus alpha u1. I have to substitute here, this is an endpoint substitution. I have to substitute the value of ux at uh, node 1 and I by definition the value of ux at node 1 is u1 and there is an alpha that came from the boundary condition, right. So where did the, where did the freak, the wavelength and all of those parameters, where did that go? It got absorbed into alpha, right, the frequency and all that. So the uh, in incident frequency is appearing somewhere in this uh, equation, right. So it is not, uh, yeah, it is not gone. So this has come from node 1. So, um, what does this look like? This equation that I have written over here, can I solve it? I mean, can I simplify it rather? What is, let us go term by term, what is this expression over here? In terms of x, is it a function of x? No, right. So, this is a constant with, there is a u1 and a u2 there. Right, and integrated over d, uh, dx, so just the length of the segment will come. What about the second term? So this is also integrated over e1. 
what kind of what polynomial is this is it constant linear quadratic quadratic right n1 is linear uh, and n1 n2 are linear so this is a quadratic function what are, uh, and what are the variables u1 u2 anything else is a variable k k is a function of x right so if my discretization is fine enough i can assume k to be approximately constant within that so point piecewise constant approximation i can make for k or if k is something more complicated there's no problem what will i do for this term use a quadrature rule in general right so this can be evaluated by quadrature right fine and from here what will happen u1 will be taken back to the left hand side okay so this um, there is a little bit of a um, there is a little bit of inaccuracy in what i just what i have said so far in in, in evaluating the uh, boundary condition okay i've written it as alpha times u1 but um, there i need to modify this a little bit okay so let's uh, erase this for now this zero term is correct this alpha u1 is slight needs a little bit of a modification okay so let's just look into that modification before we go go further so let me erase that for now this boundary condition the intuition is correct right so what is this saying that at this let's say the this is the uh this is the boundary the wave is going in this direction and at this point i am imposing this boundary condition okay similarly at the left boundary same thing is happening i am imposing <coughs> this boundary condition now this boundary condition applies to what all does it apply to let's uh, draw our uh, object over here okay so the same um, uh, antenna problem over here human being over here right so this guy is sending out let's say an incident field mm. let's read right over here okay so i have my antenna over here and what is it doing it's sending out a field like this let's say okay 1d problem so i'm trying to draw it in 1d okay i have my object over here okay these are the two boundaries of my simulation domain fine what is happening is that this wave is entering inside over here getting scattered over here going through over here and then going off over here this is physically what is happening now the intuition for the boundary condition that i had given you was that the field should not reflect back from this hypothetical boundary correct at this point what is the total field there is a scattered field that is coming from the object and a some part of the incident field both of them are outgoing and both of them should not be reflected back that's what we want okay so here there seems to be no problem but when i come here what is happening incident field is actually going in the opposite direction from outgoing the scattered field is the scattered field is the part i should not allow to come back into the simulation domain right incident field i don't care about it's given by a, a mathematical expression so this boundary condition that i'm saying that no reflection from the boundary should be applied to the total field or the scattered field scattered field should not reflect back supposing i delete the object then there is no boundary condition to impose incident field can enter from one and exit from the other and that's consistent but scattered field is always going out we are assuming that the object is fully contained inside the simulation domain so uh, what is fine the so exactly the scattered field is outgoing right so here the scattered field is outgoing here the scattered field is outgoing so the boundary condition should take care of scattered field not total field now what are the the variables that we have chosen over here what are they total field so sh should we be imposing the boundary con condition on total field or scattered field we should not be imposing it on u we should be imposing it on scattered field right so this boundary condition over here was uh let's let me write it as this e total sorry e scattered e scattered is 
proportional to this is the correct boundary condition. This is what simulates a wave not coming back, going on forever, free space. So in terms of u, what will I write this as? So e scattered, so we, all, we know that e total is e scattered plus e incident, right? So all I have to do is, since my variable is e total, so e scattered will be u minus u incident, right? So this is equal to e scattered, okay? So now let's use the boundary condition. The boundary condition is saying d by dx of ux minus u incident x is equal to alpha times u x minus u incident of x. Right? U incident of x, I we will assume is given to us. You no, know, it's a plane wave or whatever. I know the functional form. So when I simplify this once more, what do I get? D by dx. Finally, see in this equation, you see I want a condition on u prime x. Okay. So this is the important thing that we have to take, keep in mind. So the right hand side which I evaluate now, which now that I have done it a little bit more carefully, node 2 still gives me 0 as before and node 1 over here, this is what I will replace from here. Okay. So what will I get? I will get a uh, minus some term over here, there is a minus minus uh, which gets combined into what will that term be is equal to it will simply be, so what is this term evaluated at node 1, right? So alpha times u1, first term, plus u incident x at x is equal to x1 minus alpha u incident x at x is equal to x1. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Incident field is going to be given to you. We'll assume that. That's also we'll calculate it. No. Supposing I give you u x is a plane wave. No, no. We are not computing the incident field. It is given to me in functional form. For example, u incident can be uh, e to the j k x minus omega t, or some other complicated function. Because it's like the given in the problem, the current source is given to you. You can calculate what field it produces in the absence of object that's given to you. Fine? 